Senses of the court is that defendant shall serve life without the possibility of parole. I mean, she's dead because you killed her. Yes. You murdered my son, Danny. You are a killer. In the courtroom, tensions can run high, to the point where even judges can find themselves in harm's way. So, it comes as no shock that when dealing with dangerous teens, everyone must remain on high alert. We wear the pain like a heavy coat. Constant reminders every day. Every hour is the darkest time of the day. Ethan Crumbly was just 15 years old on November 30th, 2021, when he opened fire, killing four students and wounding seven others, including a teacher. Now 17, Crumbly has pleaded guilty to charges, including one count of terrorism causing death, four counts of first-degree murder, and 19 other charges related to his deadly rampage. The judge decided that Crumbly is eligible for the harshest punishment under Michigan law, life in prison without parole, a befitting sentence. So of the court is that defendant shall serve life without the possibility of parole. In the courtroom, Crumbly's behavior was unsettlingly calm and hostile. As the evidence of his crime was laid out, he remained composed. His lack of reaction was particularly noticeable when Judge Kwame Rowe delivered the ruling on his eligibility for life without parole. Crumbly barely looked up, showing no visible emotion or remorse. For everything that, that we have experienced that's hard and felt impossible, the shooter, this monster, should have to feel everything hard and painful and impossible for the rest of his life. The closest thing we can get to that is life in prison. Judge Rowe explained that his decision was influenced by Crumbly's behavior both before and after the shooting. The judge pointed out that Crumbly had an obsession with violence long before the attack. This was evident from his disturbing writings and documented cruelty to animals. Even after his arrest, Crumbly continued to engage with violent content, managing to bypass jail security to access graphic videos on a tablet. This continued fixation led Judge Rowe to conclude that Crumbly is unlikely to benefit from re rehabilitation. On November 30th, 2021, four beautiful people were taken from this earth and seven others wounded through a senseless act of evil. I believe that the Oxford High School shooter should remain in jail for the remainder of his life and be sentenced to life without the chance of parole. Crumbly's parents, Jennifer and James Crumbly, are also facing serious legal consequences. They have been charged with involuntary manslaughter for allegedly providing their son easy access to the gun used in the shooting and ignoring his pleas for mental health help. The charges against them argue that their negligence contributed to the tragic events, the very first time a case like this was being tried. I am sorry for your loss as a result of what my son did. We were good parents. During the trial, the prosecution painted out Crumbly's premeditated attack as justification for a life sentence without the possibility of parole. They presented evidence, including audio messages, where Crumbly expressed his intent to become a school shooter and his anticipation of the fun he would have. Prosecutors stressed that despite his difficult home life, Crumbly had ample opportunities to make different choices, yet he proceeded with his deadly plan. Is it true on November the 30th, 2021? When you obtained the firearm, it was not kept in a locked container or a safe. Yes, it was not locked. On the other hand, Crumbly's defense attorney, Paulette Loftin, argued for a chance at parole, asking the judge to consider Crumbly's challenging upbringing and his ignored requests for mental health treatment. Loftin thought these reasons deserved a sentence that left room for the chance of getting better in the future. After the victim's impact statements and the emotional recounting of their experiences, Crumbly himself spoke in court. He expressed remorse, acknowledging the terrible things he had done and asking for a sentence that would provide some sense of justice to the victim's families. Yet, his apology did little to sway the judge's decision. I am a really bad person. I have done terrible things that no one should ever do. Crumbly will spend the rest of his human life in the walls of the jail cell, just like the criminal in our next case who killed his sister. I mean, she's dead because you killed her. Yes. On February 4, 2007, 13-year-old Paris Lee Bennett committed a horrifying act in Abilene, Texas by murdering his four-year-old sister, Ella Bennett. Paris stabbed Ella 17 times in their home while their mother, Charity Bennett, was working late. The motive behind this brutal act was Paris's deep-seated resentment towards his mother. He believed that the most effective way to inflict emotional pain on her was to take away one of her children. And I remember, I just felt like I was drowning in shame, knowing that they saw what I had done and knew that I had, had done it. 
That night, Charity had left Paris and Ella with a babysitter because she had to work a late shift at Buffalo Wild Wings, coinciding with the Super Bowl. Around 10 p.m., Paris managed to manipulate the babysitter into leaving the house, giving him the opportunity to carry out his grim plan. Sometime before 11.30 p.m., Paris entered his sister's room and attacked her. After the murder, he called a school friend for six minutes before finally dialing 911 at 11.42 p.m. On the call, he pretended to be in a state of insanity, describing Ella as a demonic figure and feigning CPR when instructed by the dispatcher. Paris was arrested shortly after midnight. I accidentally killed somebody. You think you killed somebody? No, I know I did. I feel so messed up. Is she bleeding right now? No. Is she bleeding anywhere? Yes, yeah, she's bleeding all over the bed. Because I stabbed her. Following his arrest, Paris faced charges of capital murder. Because he was 13 at the time, he was not eligible to be tried as an adult under Texas law, which sets the minimum age at 14. Consequently, he was tried in juvenile court, where he pleaded guilty to capital murder and received the maximum sentence of 40 years in prison, with the possibility of parole after 20 years. During the legal proceedings, Paris was diagnosed as a psychopath. He later revealed that he had experienced homicidal thoughts from a young age and admitted that the murder was a calculated act intended to punish his mother rather than an impulsive outburst. He acknowledged that he had planned the murder, knowing it would result in his imprisonment, but his primary aim was to cause his mother maximum suffering by taking away both her children at once. I mean, she's dead because you killed her. Yes. The case drew significant attention due to the extreme youth of both the murderer and the victim, as well as the sick nature of the crime. His mother, Charity, had a troubled relationship with her own mother, Kyla Clark Bennett, who had been controversially acquitted of conspiring to murder Charity's father, James Robert Bennett Jr. Charity herself had struggled with drug addiction, relapsing shortly before the murder, which is believed to have been a factor in Paris's decision to kill his sister. Paris's path to violence showed warning signs even before the tragic event. He had a history of manipulative behavior and violent tendencies. In 2019, Paris spoke in an interview with Piers Morgan, where he confessed again to the premeditated nature of the murder. He explained that his rage was primarily directed at his mother, and that by killing Ella, he knew he would inflict the worst possible pain on her. As of now, why did you have such anger towards your mother? I spent a lot of time feeling alone as a child. I'm always amazed. Like, where did that feeling come from? Because for the longest time, he was my only child. Paris Bennett is serving his sentence at the Ferguson Unit Texas State Prison. He will be eligible for parole in 2027, but if he is never granted parole, he will be released in 2047 after completing his 40-year sentence. People are worried about him getting out of prison because he doesn't show any regret and his crime was carefully planned. Can't blame them. On another note, our next case is a guy who not only didn't show remorse, but literally gave the middle finger to the judge. When TJ Lane walked into the courtroom on a fateful Tuesday morning, his appearance alone was a shocking statement. The 18-year-old, convicted for the horrific murder of three classmates at Chardon High School, wore a white t-shirt with the word killer scrawled across it in black marker. This wasn't just a typical sentencing, it was the end of a heartbreaking story that had torn apart families and left lasting pain for many people involved. I hate you for the pain you have caused, Nick. You chased him down the hall and fired the last bullet that paralyzed him. On the morning of February 27th, 2012, T.J. Lane, then 17, walked into Chardon High School, located just east of Cleveland, Ohio. Armed with a 22 caliber pistol and a knife, Lane opened fire in the school's bustling cafeteria. The attack was swift and devastating, resulting in the deaths of Daniel Parmator, Demetrius Hewlin, both 16, and Russell King Jr., 17. Three other students were wounded in the rampage. Lane's motive was never clearly stated. Some believe he was targeting a romantic rival, though Lane himself claimed not to fully understand why he committed such a brutal act. Lane's upbringing was chaotic, with his dad often in prison for violent crimes and his mom in legal trouble. Growing up with his grandparents couldn't undo the effects of his troubled family life. I heard shots fired in the cafeteria. After that, we turned off all the lights in my class. He didn't say anything the entire time. He took one shot. I heard someone yelling behind me.
we get down and, and I heard a bunch of fires and shots. The courtroom was packed with the families of the victims, community members, and the media. Everyone awaited the sentencing, expecting some form of remorse or at least acknowledgement of the gravity of his crimes from Lane. Instead, they were met with a chilling display of defiance. My family will move on, not you. You have ruined your life. As proceedings began, Lane unbuttoned his blue dress shirt to reveal his disturbing t-shirt. The room fell silent. His defense team had advised him against making any statements, but Lane ignored their counsel. With a smirk, he addressed the court and, shockingly, the families of his victims. All of you, he said, before raising his middle finger in a brazen gesture of contempt. He then uttered words that would haunt everyone present. I'm saying pull the trigger to kill your son. Now it's a memory of you. The prosecutor pointed out that the t-shirt Lane wore was similar to the one he had on during the shooting, showing he felt no guilt. Even as the victim's families shared their pain, Lane showed no remorse, sometimes even smiling or smirking while they talked about their suffering. As they spoke of their grief and loss, Dinah Parmator, the mother of Daniel Parmator, addressed Lane directly, her voice shaking with anger and pain. She labeled Lane as a pathetic excuse for a human being and wished upon him an extremely slow and torturous death. You murdered my son Danny you are a killer you're a pathetic excuse for a human being in fact you're not even a human being you don't deserve to be called human you're a monster and will forever be titled a triple murderer ultimately Lane was sentenced to three life terms in prison without the possibility of parole as he was a juvenile at the time of the crime the death penalty was not an option this sentence was the maximum punishment allowable by law given his age during the commission of the crimes even though Lane was young his actions and how he acted in court showed a surprising level of cruelty and a troubling lack of empathy the court ruled him mentally fit for trial though there was evidence of him experiencing hallucinations psychosis and disturbing thoughts. After he was sentenced, Lane was sent to Allen Correctional Institution in Lima, Ohio. His behavior there was troublesome. Reports from the prison mentioned that Lane had broken the rules many times, like urinating on walls, hurting himself, and ignoring orders. He was still defiant even in prison. I have many more words I wish I could say that, I, that would express my pure disgust and hatred for you. But unlike you, as we've seen today, I obey the law. That's why I'm standing here, a free person, something you will never be. Funny enough, on September 11, 2014, Lane managed to escape from the facility along with two other inmates, prompting a massive manhunt. The community of Chardon was thrown into panic once again as schools closed and parents feared for their children's safety. However, Lane was recaptured less than 24 hours later, and his escape only added to his notoriety. My family will move on, not you. You have ruined your life. Today, Lane is housed in the Warren Correctional Institution in Youngstown, Ohio, a high-security prison where his activities are strictly monitored. Our next case follows the story of a young boy who murdered his teacher. The court will impose the mandatory life sentence for the murder of Colleen Ritzer and set a parole eligibility date of 25 years, the highest level our law allows. Philip Chisholm, the man who, at 14 years old, committed the brutal murder of his high school algebra teacher, Colleen Ritzer, appeared in court again, this time to plead guilty to another violent crime. The 25-year-old now faces additional charges stemming from a horrific and terrifying assault on a Department of Youth Services DYS worker that occurred in 2014, just months after his original crime. Back in 2013, Chisholm, then a teenager, carried out an unthinkable act at Danvers High School in Massachusetts. In a crime that that shocked the nation, he attacked Ritzer in a school bathroom. He strangled her and stabbed her repeatedly with a box cutter, then transported her body to nearby woods using a recycling bin. The details of the case were terrible, with prosecutors describing how Ritzer was stripped, battered, brutalized, and violated. For this crime, Chisholm was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years in 2016. But despite being found guilty, Chisholm stared blankly with no emotions on his face as the judge read his sentence years later. For the period of not less than 40 years and not more than 40 years and one day. Chisholm's violent tendencies resurfaced. Appearing in Boston Juvenile Court, he pleaded guilty to charges related to the assault of a DYS worker on June 2, 2014. Assistant District Attorney David Bradley detailed the attack, stating that Chisholm, who was then 15, managed to evade staff at the Metropolitan Detention Center in Dorchester. He followed a female clinician into a bathroom area where he launched a vicious assault. In a twisted 
sequence of events, Chisholm removed his sandals to move silently and, holding a sharpened pencil, stalked the clinician into the staff locker room. Bradley recounted how Chisholm waited for the 29-year-old woman to exit the bathroom before pouncing on her. He placed his hands around her neck, choking her and forcing her against the cinder block wall. The victim struggled to free herself from his grip, but Chisholm began punching her repeatedly in the face, head, and jaw. Her screams for help alerted other staff members who rushed in to restrain him. The victim escaped, gasping for air, with injuries to her neck, face, jaw, and back. Throughout the ordeal, Chisholm reportedly yelled, I'm gonna kill them all. Charging the defendant, Philip Chisholm, with aggravated rape. What say you of the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty. When the judge asked if he admitted to the facts as presented by the prosecution, Chisholm calmly responded, That is correct, Your Honor. His admission brought some closure to the victim, who was not present in court, but provided a powerful impact statement through the prosecutor. She described Chisholm as a monster and spoke of the haunting memories of the attack, saying, Following this horrific and terrifying event, I remembered the bruises across my face, around my body, and my neck. His face still haunts me, that lack of emotion, just ready to kill. True monsters exist in this world. Philip Chisholm is a monster. Chisholm's violent behavior during his youth had a lasting impact on everyone affected. The Colleen Ritzer Memorial Fund, created to honor the cherished teacher, still gives grants and scholarships to future educators. Reitzer, known for her lively personality and love for teaching, completed her studies at Assumption College in 2011 and was an exceptional student at Andover High School. My opinion is that on the date of the alleged offense, uh, Mr. Chisholm was not suffering from a mental disease or defect. Her family, devastated by her loss, expressed their grief in a statement at the time of her death. We are mourning the tragic death of our amazing, beautiful daughter and sister. Everyone that knew and loved Colleen knew of her passion for teaching and how she mentored each and every one of her students. The additional charges against Chisholm included attempted murder by strangulation, assault with intent to murder, kidnapping, and two counts of assault, and battery with a dangerous weapon. Even though Chisholm was already in custody during the 2014 assault, his behavior showed that he he still had a tendency toward violence, showing the ongoing threat he posed. With this latest guilty plea, Chisholm's already long list of violent offenses grows, and his future within the correctional system becomes even worse. He was sentenced again to 17 years in prison. His crimes, especially the tragic killing of Colleen Ritzer and the vicious assault on the DYS worker, have caused immense pain and fear, affecting numerous lives, just like in our next case, where a 17-year-old murders a literal baby. He pretends to be remorseful, as when he tells his mother. I am a 16-year-old blonde. Probably all I have to do is cry in front of the jury, and they're going to feel sorry for me. Dylan Shoemaker, a teenager from Springville, faced the harshest consequences for the horrific crime he committed. At 17, Shoemaker was convicted of second-degree murder for the brutal death of his girlfriend's toddler son, Austin Smith. The sentencing, which took place on a Friday morning, saw him receive the maximum penalty, 25 years to life in prison. I would give my life for Austin. I loved him a lot. The tragic events unfolded on March 19th, 2018. Shoemaker was babysitting Austin and his infant brother, while their mother, his girlfriend, was at work. The 23-month-old boy endured a fatal beating at the hands of Shoemaker. Prosecutors revealed that Shoemaker had hit the boy on the head several times. In a desperate attempt to silence Austin's cries, Shoemaker muffled the child's face with a pillow before striking him three more times. During the trial, the prosecution presented damning evidence against Shoemaker. They pointed out a pattern of violence behavior and neglect towards the children. This pattern, coupled with the severity of the crime, played a significant role in the jury's decision to convict him of second-degree murder and child abuse resulting in death. State Supreme Court Justice M. William Boller presided over the sentencing. He did not hold back in his condemnation of Schumacher, labeling him a manipulator and deceiver. His remarks were based on a collection of 13 letters from witnesses and family members that painted a clear picture of Schumacher's character. The record will show that you admit on that on July 23rd, 2013, in a phone call to your mother from the holding center, you stated, and I got a quote from the court reporter, I am a 16-year-old blonde. Probably all I have to do is cry in front of the jury, and they're going to feel sorry for me. Shoemaker's violent outburst on that fateful day robbed a mother of her child and a brother of his sibling. So him trying to cry in front of the jury and judge is just him trying to insult their evidence. Don't be deceived by his tears. They're tears of a psychopath. I didn't mean to kill Austin. Actually, I really didn't. I really think I did. I didn't mean to hurt him. 
At the time of his sentencing in 2014, Shoemaker was just 17 years old. Now, in his late 20s, he remains behind bars, serving a sentence that shows the deep loss and pain caused to an innocent life. The courtroom at his sentencing was a solemn place, resonating with the delivery of justice, even though it came too late to save Austin Smith.